Hey, Wire Monkeys, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Cabling. This episode, we're talking Fiber Testing 101. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, technicians, project managers, estimators, even customers. We're connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and that bell button to be notified when new content is being produced? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms, would you mind giving us a five-star rating? And if the show is not a five-star rated show, email me and let me know what would make it a five-star show. Those two simple little steps helps us take on the algorithm so we can slay it and get this message out to even more people in the ICT industry. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? You know, I do a live stream on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and a bunch of other places at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, where you get to ask your favorite RCDD, and you know that's me. Don't even try to pretend like it's anybody else. You know it's me. Your favorite questions on installation, certification, design, project management, even career path questions. But I could hear you now. Chuck, I'm drunk from my drunk at 6 p.m. on Thursdays. I don't want to get into that. Relax. I record them. And you can catch them at letstalkcabling.com. And finally, while this show is free and will always remain free, if you find value in this content, would you mind clicking on this QR code right there? You can buy me a cup of coffee. You can even schedule a 15-minute one-on-one call with me, after hours, of course. And, of course, we're always looking for corporate sponsorships. So if you're company's values are educate, encourage, and enrich, and you want to help support a vendor-neutral platform to get the message out to more people, get in touch with me. On today's show, we're talking Fiber Basics 101. I never make the assumption that everybody knows everything about the cable industry that I know or that my guest knows. So from time to time, I do these shows where you have we do 101 type of material, right? So that way we can make sure everybody gets caught up because there are people new to this industry. I met in teaching class like week, I had a guy in the class who literally had two weeks of experience. Two weeks. 20-year-old kid. And, man, I'll tell you what, he had a good head on his shoulders. So we're bringing in a special guest, a return guest, to help us cover some very uh, some very 101 fiber optic testing kind of things. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Steve Cows from AM. How you doing, buddy? Thanks, Chuck. It's good to be here. Doing great. Hope you are, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, the audience won't see it, but... You know, it took me, uh, what, five attempts to get through that intro. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. So, I, so I like your, you know, the, the, the five, give me a five-star rating. So does that mean, you know, two and a half for you and two and a half for me? <laughs> right. Is yes. That what, is that what yes. We bring? <laughs> yes. That's exactly how that works out. Well, actually, no, I think, I think, I think it's 60, 40. Yeah. I, I think, I think I get the more because on my platform. Three and two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's just get right into it. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, some fiber stuff, right? So first one I'll cover is, what is a dB? Ah, dB. That is decibel. And uh, dB is what we use when we are uh, measuring loss on fiber. It's a, it's a relative thing. You know, we're, since we're talking fiber, dB is going to be a relative uh, power measurement. So you're going to look at, uh, you, you set a reference and it, and it, it, and this will segue you know, into something else, I'm sure. But but initially, when you look at a fiber, you're looking at power and DBM, and you've got to essentially set a reference. You set a you know uh, a baseline, if you will, mm-hmm. and that baseline is expressed in dB. When you set a reference, it says zero dB. So once you've done that, then when you take your testers to opposite ends of the fiber and connect, you get another value in dB. And that value is the loss along the fiber. Um, back in the old days, we didn't have a dB and a dBm. We just had a power meter that gave us raw power. We wrote that number down, and then we took the the units to opposite ends of the fiber, wrote the second number down, and we did the math. Uphill both ways in the snow. In the snow, yeah. <laughs> when you said back in our days, I was like, that's the first thing that went through my mind. I heard my dad back. I, we had to walk to school uphill both ways in the snow. It's like I didn't realize it snowed that much then. <laughs> right. So just oh, to yeah. kind of give you, I'm just going to throw some. These are obviously not realistic numbers, but 
So the whole purpose, you know, you can fire up your power, power source and light meter, and you got to wait for it to stabilize, right? And I guess every manufacturer, that, that amount of time is going to vary. Check it, with your manufacturer. Will. Yeah, typically it's going to be between five and 10 minutes. Ours ours is five minutes. Um, there are a couple others that are probably about the same. Some of them out there are 10, but always consult your you know yes. user manual, RTM, read the manual. Uh, there you and, go. And, uh, and, you know, we're guys, we don't read the manual. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but yeah, check with your manufacturer, look in the manual. It'll tell you how long you need to warm up, but you want that, that to stabilize. Um, right. And then you do that set reference. Um, and then another good point, since we're kind of on that topic, is that if you disconnect your test reference cord from the transmit port, the light source, after you've done a set reference, you got set reference again. If you power your equipment down, it may retain that reference, but it's good practice to right. set a new reference. So I, I, absolutely, it is absolutely. And here's, here's here's another good tip. I want to add on to this since since we're already going down the pro tip range right now. If you're a company or you work for a company that has multiple different types of optical loss test sets, know the value for each manufacturer. Because you mentioned yours was five minutes, and there is one out there that I talked to. I had him on the show once many many years ago. I can say that because the podcast is four years old. Many years ago, um, he said 15 minutes, 15 minutes. So make sure you understand, you know, hey, if you're using my AEM, that's going to be five minutes. I'm using, you know, brand XYZ, that might be a different value. Because if you don't wait the appropriate time, you'll start getting negative DB numbers. Well, and this is also assuming you have not left your tester in harsh conditions overnight or all day long, like all day long in the heat in Arizona in the middle of summer or overnight in, you know, Juneau, Alaska in the middle of winter. Um, that never happens. That, that that technicians, be, always, technicians always bring their test equipment at night. Always. Yeah. Yeah. yeah your, your equipment may need to warm up a little longer in that case. Right. 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 So, okay. So DB decibel, the B's capitalized. And uh, do you know why that B's capitalized? I don't. That's a what? trivia question. I what? do not know why. You know, I should Alan, know that. Being a ham Alexander radio Graham Bell. Person, I should know that. Ah, yes, yes. Al Bell. Alexander Graham Bell. That's a Bell. Yes. And I heard a, I heard, I read a. Th actually, I didn't hear. I read a thing once on the internet. So you know that means it's got to be true. Um, I read somewhere on the internet that when Alexander Graham Bell died, AT and T shut off all phone service of the continental United States for two hours. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's on the internet, so it's got to be true. And that sounds like something they would do. All right, so so we are so we know what a decibel is. Now let's talk about what is a dBm. Ah, decibel milliwatt, decibel hyphen milliwatt. <clears throat> it's a power power measurement. That's what we use when we're measuring measuring the absolute power of, say, a light source. You know, stabilized light source we're using for testing, or if you're measuring measuring the absolute power of a transmitter on on the remote end of a fiber, you want to find out how much juice you got coming over the fiber, um, that, that is measured in, in DBM, decibel milliwatts. Um, like a, a light source power meter, you know, your optical loss test set. For multi-mode, you're looking probably in that negative 18 to negative 22, 23 range is what you'd see. Uh, single mode could be plus four to minus four typically. Um, is what you see now when you get into field equipment, you know, the actual stuff that's out there could be a broad range. And right. uh, like telco equipment is going to have a lot more power. Cable TV equipment is going to have a lot more power than what we use in local area networks because it's got to go greater distances. And that number, that DBM number is important because in fiber optics, you've got transmitters and receivers and transceivers they are combined and the transmit power can't come into the receiver hotter than the than the sensitivity of the receiver. So if that power is too high, it blinds the receiver. If it's too low, like you got too much loss on the fiber, then you're not going to be able to communicate because it's not even going to sense the signal there. So that's where that number comes in. So let me make sure I, I can, because I always want to make sure we try to say this in a way that maybe somebody who has two weeks of experience in the industry might understand. <laughs> like, ah. like the kid, like that 20, hey, i tell you something about that 20 year old kid, right? So, he came in, he, gave, not, he passed the test, only missed it by one question. And uh, he had a great score. He, and then I said, thank you, congratulations. He, then he left. He came back like 10 minutes later because he finished before, before half, most everybody else. He came back 
said 10 minutes later, hey, can I help you carry out anything? 20 nice. year old kid. Nice. Done. You people people like to say our industry's in, in, you know, these you use young whippersnappers. I'm telling you, there's some great people out there. There really it's are. Hard, if they're yeah. not, it, yeah. It's hard to generalize. You know. Yes. You know, there's people you can all actually ages. Make, yeah. Right. And you can make them into good ones. Well, most of them into good ones. So so just to kind of recap, the what the DBM is telling me is if that light is in the sweet spot, like like a baseball analogy, right? It's in the it's in the box. If it's yeah. outside the box, then it's it's not useful. But if it's in the yeah. box, that means home run. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's and, going, it's going, yep. it's going. <laughs> and and in a nutshell, DBM okay. is, is the power, and DB is your relative number. So that's your, that's you measure your loss in DB, and you look at, you look at or read power or measure power in DBM. Right. So let's let's talk about uh, you hear you know, when you look, read through fiber testing literature, right? Or the owner's manuals, you know, the thing that us guys don't ever read. <laughs> What's an event dead zone? Ah, now we're talking about OTDR. So uh, event dead zone with an OTDR, the way an OTDR works, sends a pulse of light down the fiber. It's looking for reflections coming back. And it looks at, you know, the backscatter reflection of the fiber itself, the events, you know, mated connectors, splices, all these things create a reflection. And um, every piece of test equipment has what they call uh, an event dead zone. Um, and that event dead zone is once you hit that reflective event, how far can that light travel before you can see another event? So it's kind of like a blind spot. So it, let's say it's half a meter for instance. That means if you have a, a made pair of connectors, once it hits that reflection, it can't see another reflective event for another half a meter. And if you get events that are too close, they're within that event dead zone, sometimes they'll make that one event look like one big event and it makes it stretches that pulse out. So if you've ever seen an OTDR pulse, it spikes up for, for a reflective event. It might make it come up, but it, mm -hmm. it, goes, it looks weird because it, it's, it's a much wider uh, event. Or it could do what they call like a stair step where it comes up and then it chunks down before it, it continues on. So it, it's essentially the blind spot <clears throat> of, of the unit. Now, this also is why we use launch cords on OTDRs because you don't want to connect your fiber under test directly to the interface of your OTDR. Um, if you do that, you can't tell what's going on with that first connector on your fiber under test. So you want to use a launch cord. I've got one right here. Just a, you know, um, ours are 150 meter. So <clears throat> you want to use a launch cord. And what that does, it allows that signal to quiet down over the length of the launch cord. Um, and launch cord length is going to be dependent on pulse width. You know, how long of fiber you're testing is going to need a longer pulse width. You're going to need a longer launch cord. But the ones we've got 150 for what the fiber we're testing in the land environment, the lengths that we're testing, that's, that's a pretty much a sweet spot. So what that does, you put that launch cord on and then you can actually see that connector when you mate that, that launch cord to the fiber under test, because it's no longer in that, that dead zone area. And, <clears throat> and then again, when you hit that next reflective event, that first mated pair, you're going to have a dead zone there. So if it's a half meter, that means within a half a meter, if there's another connector, you you would probably not see it. Uh, so it's important to understand what that dead zone is. And the rule of thumb <clears throat> is you want to have a launch cord, minimum length launch cord that's twice uh, what your dead what your um, the dead zone created by your pulse width would be. And there's a calculation out there for that. I don't remember it off the top of my head, um, but you can tell by the pulse width what that that length will be. And you want to double what that that distance is. Would it be? Would it be? I know if I choose too short of a patch cord, that could give me that could give me some, some issues. But would it hurt anything if I use too long of a pat, too long of a launch cord? No, you you uh, the only thing with using too long of a launch cord with an OTDR is um, when you set an OTDR test, you're going to set a max length you're going to test also. Um, now some OTDRs will have a, a auto sense and they'll say, okay, it's this long. I'm going to set my, my distance. If your launch cord is really, really long and you increase your, that your overall length of the test, including the launch cords to a level where you've got to then increase your max length. You also may have to adjust your pulse width 
uh, accordingly. So, um, you know, it's, it, you know, if, based on what you're testing, you know, 150 to 500 meters is typical um, for, for launch cords in, in our arena for the most part. Uh, 500 is even a bit long for some of the stuff we test because uh, usually we're not going past three kilometers um, in the normal right. environment, although the fiber can go further. Uh, but when you get into outside plant, it's a whole different ball game because <clears throat> they're using a much longer pulse width and you've got to have a much longer launch cable in those cases as well. So would, would a technician purchase a launch cable or would they make their own or could they make their own? Um, I wouldn't recommend making a launch cable in the field. You could, uh, especially if you're using a fusion splicer, I guess. Um, but it's, it's, and some people will, will describe a launch cord as just a long patch cord, which kind of it is. Uh, you want something that's good quality. You want to have something that's a high grade fiber. You don't, <clears throat> just like a test reference cord, you don't want to use, you know, just some old piece of fiber you've had sitting in your warehouse for 15 years. Um, you know, <laughs> you want something quality. And in a pinch, you could you could make a launch cord. Now, most manufacturers will recommend you use their launch cords because we've tested our OTDR with our launch cords, so we know what to expect. So when you introduce manufacturing your own launch cord, you're you're adding additional variables. So Yeah, you know, it's always I tell people all the time, you know, um, you know, factory made stuff is usually better quality and most tech most, most fiber techs don't like to hear that because they think they're the best but it's not it's not it's not a reflection of the technician's skills it's a reflection of the environment and the tools right it is because when it you is. look when you look at most manufacturers you know the, i just kind of give an example the pre terminated fiber trunk assembly. i saw a post of this on uh on i think it was low voltage nations facebook group i think this week somebody's asking about using pre-terminated fiber and, and should I use it or not use it? And the answer is yes and no, right? It kind of really all depends, right? And yeah, I mean, pre-terminated fiber, if, if, if you're a company that doesn't do a lot of fiber, so you don't have a lot of skills within the company, pre-terminated fiber is the way to go because they're made in a clean room environment and they use better lapping film and they use 400 power scopes where most fiber techs typically use 100 power scopes. Um, so they're gonna be better quality because of the, and because of all that, and that's all that that person all day does all day long is terminate fiber. You take a regular fiber person, you know how many fibers do they tip a day if they even do it every day? Mm -hmm. Then there's there's that that rolls into it as well too. So yeah, I mean I I would say you know st stick with the factory made uh, test reference cord or or launch cord. For that very fact right there because you're not you are not going to duplicate that quality in the field and it's it's not and i'm not saying you're not a good tech i'm just saying you just don't have the the extremely expensive tools and the clean room environment to do that stuff it, and you probably don't have something an instrument with you in the field to measure optical return loss uh and i'm not talking about right. what we get off the otdr i'm talking about a return loss meter uh to measure that and and really for any of your test reference cords and launch cords those should be tested for that at the factory. So. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of pre terminated fiber trunk assemblies and launch cords, a lot of those ends get looked at with an interferometer and an oh, interferometer yeah. is a very expensive piece of equipment and it measures the geometry of the end face in relationship to where the core is. And it gives you all kinds of values, tells you if it's within parameters or not. And I've yet to see a technician out in the field that has a interferometer in the back of their truck. Nope. <laughs> no, no. All right, so what's an attenuation dead zone? We talked about event dead uh, zones. What's an attenuation dead zone? It relates more to what you can measure beyond that reflective event. And and it's uh, it, it can affect what you see beyond the event. And the, now attenuation dead zone is always going to be longer than your event dead zone. You look at any manufacturer's documentation on their OTDR. Your, atten your event dead zone is the shorter of the two. And that's because the attenuation dead zone, if I remember correctly, is made up of your pulse width plus your event dead zone. So you take that pulse width, turn that into a distance, add that to your event dead zone, and that creates another length. It's a longer length. And so let's say you know, your, your, um, your event dead zone is half a meter, your attenuation dead zone is maybe two meters. And that means that when you hit that reflective event within two meters, while you might see another reflective event, like a meter and a half out, 
you might not be able to measure the attenuation accurately of that that event. Um, the other thing is if that if that event a meter and a half out is a splice and it's a good splice, you may not see the good splice at that point um, because it's not a reflective event technically. So um, so that's what the attenuation dead zone means. And every manufacturer will will list these in their 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 documentation. They'll have the event dead zone and the attenuation dead zone, and they're both important to understand. And this kind of this kind of leads into why, you know, in some cases, if you think you have something going on with your, your fiber, you know, 99% of why we use an OTDR is because we're failing a loss test. We want to find out why. And you shoot it and you don't see anything that's contributing. Go to the other end of the fiber and shoot it in the opposite direction. Sometimes because of that attenuation dead zone, that event dead zone, you will see different events from one end versus the other end. That's why we do bi-directional testing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and so let me, let me ask you this then. Um, so the, you said there's a, the, the event dead zones and the attenuation dead zones are documented in the, uh, the owner's manual somewhere. Is that yes. important information for the tech out in the field to look it up and know it? They don't necessarily need to know it. Um, chances are whoever in their organization purchased that product or specified that they purchased the product has already looked that up because that's one of the one of the things that people will compare between different manufacturers of OTDRs. They'll look at that and say, oh, who's got the best attenuation? Who's got the best event dead zone? Um, you know, who's got the best dynamic range? They always compare all these specs. Techs in the field don't have to worry too much about that. Um, it's it it may be important to understand if they're doing a troubleshooting situation like that. And and this is something I, I'd say too. If you're doing a, um, we, we do two kinds of optical loss testing. There's dual-ended single direction and dual-ended bi-direction. Now, when you do your either one, if you're having a loss issue, that loss issue in some cases may show up only traveling one direction on one fiber. And that could be a clue for you as to where to go look, which end to start if you're going to deploy your OTDR. Um, so you can find it, you know, you may not have to do a bi-directional ODDR. You may can just shoot it one direction and find, find that event. Um, most times when we have issues like this, it's one end to the other where we're seeing issues with the fiber. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the OTDR is a really good tool for finding those problems. So I already know the answer to this, but I want to hear you say it. Which is better for documenting the performance of the cable, an optical loss test set or an OTDR? Optical loss test set, hands down. You, <laughs> and which you, is better your, for troubleshooting? Well, they both are good for troubleshooting, but if you're you're having problems figuring out where the loss is coming from, OTDR is the way to go there. So, yeah. And it's, and, and some people go, Oh, OTDR is more expensive. It's got to be a better instrument. It's, you know, it's giving right. us all these pretty, graphs and all this other stuff. So it's got to be better than just doing a loss test. Well, it's the loss you see in an OTDR trace is not the same loss that you see when you measure loss with a stabilized light source in an optical loss test set. That is much more accurate for, for, for performance is using that optical loss test set. Well, the OTDR is looking at the, the, uh, the, uh, the IOR index of refraction and it's calculating that loss where the optical loss test sets it's since you've already zeroed out the meter, it knows exactly how much it lost. Yeah. The OTDR, you know, with the IOR, with the strength of the reflections coming back, uh, it's able to determine pretty, pretty accurately what those loss values are on those things, but it's not, it's not the end all. It is not acceptable as certification. Uh, and, and I've had that discussion right. with people who say, oh, I need to certify with my OTDR. Well, if that's all you're using, it's not certification. <laughs> so um, right. it's, it's a great instrument and it can be part of certification. It's a supplement called, it's called tier two. When you take an optical loss test set and you add an OTDR trace, that's what tier two is. And a lot of times what you'll find is cu customers not knowing any better will spec out tier one. I mean, sorry, tier two testing. And their RFQs, request for quotes or RFPs, request for proposals, but the manufacturer wants tier one testing for warranty purposes. So, so you got to do both tests in that scenario. Now we mentioned IOR. I just want to make sure I clarify that that's 
index of a fraction, and that's just literally how fast the photon travels down the fiber. It's a, it's a speed percentage of one. Yep. Yep. Speed yeah, limit. Exactly right. So it's it's like NVP yep. and copper. So you mentioned uh, pulse width, pulse width several times. Short pulse width, long pulse width. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is each, what what are each of those? So the pulse width is the it's the length of that pulse of light that the unit is sending down down the glass. For shorter distances, you use a narrower pulse width or shorter pulse width uh, because you don't have to go as far. Uh, for the longer distances, you're going to have a much longer pulse width. And then, of course, that the longer pulse width also affects your dead zones. Your dead zone increases when you have a longer pulse width. Um, for what we do in the local area network arena, uh, in structured cabling and campuses, you know, three kilometers or less, we're using shorter pulse widths. Um, you know, anywhere from five to, to maybe 50 at the most nanoseconds. Um, but you could be using 2,500 nanoseconds. You know, you could, you know, be using a much greater pulse width when you're getting into long haul fiber. So just gonna make, again, I'm gonna break this down for the for the new people. So if a, if a if a if a light source turns on its light for five nanoseconds, well, light travels at 186,282 miles a second. If you really want to, you can do the math and find out exactly how. Then I'll tell you how long that 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 piece of light is. So if I have a cable that's giving me some issues, well, you, when we're talking about like the event dead zones and attenuation dead zones, would a shorter pulse width be better to troubleshoot that with? Yes. Um, and it all depends on the equipment. Um, now, the, the problem with you, if you get the pulse width too short, your OTDR trace can become a little dirty, if you will. You start to see all kinds of things. Um, so it may make it a little more difficult to troubleshoot that way. But yeah, generally speaking, using a shorter pulse width is going to help you to, to find some of those things. Because if you've got a longer pulse width, you know, if, if your manufacturer rates their pulse width at half a meter, I mean, their dead zone at half a meter for an event dead zone, maybe that, that half a meter is with a five nanosecond pulse width, but you're using a 20 nanosecond pulse width or 25 nanosecond pulse width. Now your dead zone's increased. Uh, so you may not see that. Um, and short patch cords uh, in a link can wreak havoc with that too because you you can't see things after that first event and i've seen people actually will take a um they'll take a launch box um it's like a launch cable mm -hmm. but it, it has female connectors on it and what they'll do is they'll they'll use a short patch cord at their otdr uh plug into the launch box and and then they use a short patch cord or test reference cord to go from the launch box into the panel where the fiber under test is the problem is you hit that connector where you plug that short cord into on the launch box that's a big reflection right there and if your patch cord is not long enough you don't see that first connector on the on the uh, the panel so if you're using a launch mm -hmm. box just keep that in mind um you're 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 th there is a disadvantage to that versus a launch cord steve you're a wealth of information as usual i appreciate you coming on the show my friend it's always fun always fun i'm gonna have to have you on uh, on my show again soon too so we got name we got, a day oh, and time april is special we got uh it's going to be fiber related coming up and it's going to have a bixie cec associated with it this time so nice yeah nice so. nice well make sure you let me know that so i can share that out as well too we'll do. i've always got people asking me for for cec stuff i got i've got my fire stopping class recognized for cecs I just submitted another class like two weeks ago for CEC recognition. I don't want to say what it is yet until I, I get the letter saying it's approved. And then, uh, and then I'm doing, I'm speaking at TKW in Nashville and I'm trying to get that one recognized for CECs too. So I'll have three, cool. the, the, the podcast with three CEC classes. So. Nice. Yeah. Yes. We're growing. We're growing. Excellent. All right, brother, man. I appreciate you coming on. All right, Chuck. Good chat with you. Take care. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.